food. Daniel from California, choosing whether to pay the rent or pay to fix the car to get to work doesn't leave us with much at all. Now we can't even pay for meals. Donna from Louisiana. The storm just hit, and we went from donating to the food bank to needing it. Keisha from South Carolina. I've been skipping meals so my two kids can eat, but filling up on water doesn't really work. Hunger is a story we can end. End it at feedingamerica.org. Brought to you by Feeding America. You're listening to bostonfreeradio.com. Hello and welcome to Words on Film, the spoken word show dedicated to moving pictures. I'm your host and movie critic, Dan Burke, and Words on Film is, your so- blah, is a show to which you are listening on bostonfreeradio.com and WBCALP FM Boston, watching and listening on Somerville Community Access TV or SCATV or some community access TV station that was kind enough to pick up this broadcast, or you are watching and listening to me on Facebook Live, either on my own personal page or on Boston Free Radio's Facebook page. Either way, you could join me. I'm glad you could join me to discuss my favorite topic, which is movies. And I have four new movies to review for you for the show. I can only get to four. I try to reach five, but that is actually my absolute maximum but first let's get to my usual first segment which is what's topping the box office these are the top 10 highest grossing films of this past weekend some of them are hits some of them aren't but i'll let you know the difference as i go along and we're going to start off with the number one movie at the box office which also happens to be the number one highest grossing debut movie of the week which is the house with a clock and its walls directed by eli roth and starring jack black and kate blanchett amongst other people it grossed a pretty good 26.6 million dollars here in the state and $35.9 million worldwide against a budget of $42 million, which means it's not a hit yet here in the States or around the world, but it is a Halloween-themed movie, or at least one that will not be inappropriate for Halloween, which means that since Halloween is about four weeks away, we will probably be seeing this movie in the top ten at least for another month, hopefully. Number two at the box office is actually a movie that climbed from number three last week and is the only movie in the top ten that didn't debut that actually ascended in the ranks. And that is A Simple Favor, which is probably getting a little bit of word of mouth here and there. But A Simple Favor made $10.3 million here in the States and Canada. And so far... Against a budget of $20 million, it has grossed $32.4 million domestically and $42.6 million internationally, which makes it a tentative hit here in the States, off to a great start in just two weeks. And around the world, it has eked its way to being a certified hit. And it's just bound to go higher in the next couple of weeks. The Nun, in its third week in release, actually slid from number two last week to number three this week, having grossed $10 million even stateside, including Canada. And against a budget of $22 million, The Nun is doing extremely well. It has grossed $100.6 million domestically and $293 million internationally, making it a certified hit here in the States and around the world, and an inevitable sequel will probably be in the works, even though my opinion in this is that it wasn't that great. But in any event, audiences are still paying money to see it. The Predator, in its second week of release, slid from number one last week all the way down to number four this week, having grossed just $9.2 million. Against a budget of $88 million, The Predator is struggling a bit, having made $40.9 million here in the States and Canada, and around the world it has made $95.8 million, making it not even close to a hit here statewide, but around the world it is a tentative hit so far. Will it be a certified hit? It might be, but it's not looking good for The Predator. Crazy Rich Asians, in its sixth week in release, is doing extremely well for itself, having grossed $6.3 million in the States and Canada this past weekend. Against a budget of $30 million, which is actually pretty modest for a movie that has Crazy Rich in its title, Crazy Rich Asians has so far grossed $159.3 million here in the States 
and $206.7 million worldwide, making it, of course, a certified hit here in the States and around the world and probably one of the top highest grossing films of the year so far. It hasn't reached the billions yet and it probably never will, but it's still doing extremely well, especially given its modest budget. White Boy Rick is also in its second week of release, along with The Predator, and it is number six of the box office this weekend, dropping from number four last week, having grossed $4.9 million stateside. Against a budget of $29 million, White Boy Rick has so far grossed $17.3 million domestically, making it not a hit yet here in the States, and I don't have the international numbers for you for this movie. Peppermint, starring Jennifer Garner, is number seven at the box office, sliding slightly from number six last week, having grossed three, excuse me, three point seven million dollars this past weekend stateside. Against a budget of twenty-five million dollars, Peppermint has so far grossed thirty point three million dollars here in the states and thirty-six point three million dollars worldwide, making it a tentative hit here in the states and around the world. Fahrenheit 11.9 is the second highest grossing debut movie of the week, but it goes to show you how many new movies have been available this past weekend. It is number eight at the box office, and every other debut movie didn't even make the top ten. But Fahrenheit 11.9 for a documentary debuted strong at $3 million, and that's after opening in over 1,700 theaters around the country. Against a budget of $4.5 million, Fahrenheit 9, excuse me, Fahrenheit 11.9 has so far grossed $3 million, and it is not indicated how much it's grossed internationally, but it's off to a really great start so far, even though I can't call this movie a hit just yet. The Meg is sinking its way from Summer Returns, having grossed $2.3 million at the box office stateside. And it is in its seventh week in release and fell from number seven last week. I said it wouldn't be in the top ten, or I predicted it wouldn't be in the top ten when I was doing the the what's topping the box office last week, but I was wrong. It's still hanging in there. And against a budget of $130 to $178 million, the Meg has so far grossed $140.4 million domestically and $517.7 million internationally, making it Almost a hit here in the States. It's hard to tell what kind of hit it is. But around the world, it's most certainly a certified hit. And finally, number 10 of the box office is the movie Searching, which fell from number 8 last week to number 10 this week, having grossed $2.2 million at the U.S. box office this past weekend. Against an undisclosed budget, Searching has so far grossed $23.1 million here in the States and $54.2 million worldwide. And I don't have the budget for this movie. It still hasn't been released after five weeks of this movie's release, but I can tell you... It probably took maybe no more than Most 10. Most of my family, they never graduated high school, so I'm trying to break that barrier. My daughter, Brooklyn, was also a motivation for me to go back to school. Every day after work, went straight to school, and it paid off. At age 26, Kareem finished his high school diploma. I could not have done it alone. I see the future is really bright for me. No one gets a diploma alone. If you're thinking of finishing your high school diploma, you have help. Find free adult education classes near you at finishyourdiploma.org. Brought to you by the Dollar General Literacy Foundation and the Ad Council. Never Stop the Madness, Tuesdays at 9 p.m. BostonFreeRadio.com Welcome back to Words on Film, the spoken word show dedicated to moving pictures. I'm your host and movie critic, Dan Burke. The first movie I'm going to be reviewing for you is The House with a Clock in Its Walls, which is based on a 1973 novel of the same name by John Belairs. It's kind of hard to believe that it's been this long since the, a, a movie based on this book has been made, but apparently this is one of those books like A Wrinkle in Time that many people in grade school and junior high have read sort of on their own. I'll admit that I haven't read it, but after seeing the movie, I actually do kind of want to read the book. 
And what's also significant about a house, excuse me, the house with a clock in its walls, it is the first family film to be directed by Eli Roth. Now, Eli Roth is a 46-year-old director who has actually made quite a name for himself directing a lot of not-so-family-friendly films, particularly horror films like Cabin Fever, Hostel, and Hostel Part 2, and The Green Inferno. He did kind of switch genres with his remake of Death Wish, starring Bruce Willis, that came out earlier this year, that didn't get a lot of great reviews, even from me, but... Still, The House of the Clock and Its Walls actually shows that Eli Roth can actually direct a really good family-friendly movie, almost similar in tonal shifts to movies of, of similar scope by Martin Scorsese with his um, directing Hugo. And I was actually reminded a lot of Hugo when I saw this movie, not only because of the fact that it's a family-friendly film by a not-so-family-friendly director, but also the, the similar themes in the, in the movie, the supernatural, also a little bit of steampunk mechanics in there. But in any event, the movie takes place in 1955 in a town called New Zeb Zebedee, Michigan, which I don't think is a town that actually exists. But... It follows the exploits of a 10-year-old by the name of Louis Barnevelt, who's played in this movie by, uh, by a child actor named Owen Vaccaro, who has been in a couple of movies. He's been in both Daddy's Home movies as Mark Wahlberg's son and Will Ferrell's stepson. And this is his first arguably lead role. But in any event, this child is orphaned because his parents were in a car accident and he's sent to Michigan to live with his eccentric uncle Jonathan Barnevelt who's played by Jack Black and as it turns out Jack Black's character lives in a mansion with a lot of clocks on the walls and eccentricities along with his platonic friend Florence Zimmerman who's played in this movie by Kate Blanchett and there actually turns out to be a lot of history behind this house. And the reason that there are so many clocks in the walls of this house is because there's one particular clock that keeps on ticking and it drives Jonathan Barnevelt crazy. And he put a lot of these other cuckoo clocks and other noise-making clocks on the walls to drown out the noise of this one big clock, but it turns out it's not actually working. And when I thought of the name, the house with a clock in its walls, I thought to myself, this is a clock you can see, but actually it's, it's a clock you can't see, as in there is no face, but there's something inside the house that's literally ticking. Nothing that's especially dangerous, but... It's, it's still a mysterious house. And I think, actually, this is a movie that is, is similar to Hugo, in a sense. As I said, there's not only a child protagonist with whom you identify and, and feel for, but there's also a little bit of a science fiction element to this movie. It also reminded me of some other haunted house films, and there's certainly an element of Halloween and Deca macabre, <laughs> I almost said the wrong word there, within this film. And I, of course, will see anything with Jack Black in it. As a matter of fact, while he has not exactly made a comeback over the last couple of years, I think he's still kind of recovering from the critical setback that was his earlier film, Gulliver's Travels, which was made eight years ago, but he's still getting out there and he's still making really funny movies and he still has very funny performances. As a matter of fact, when he made Goosebumps a couple of years ago, that was a movie which I wasn't exactly in love with, but I did say that every time Jack Black did something as simple as just poking his head out of bushes, I, I laughed instantly. And he has that similar effect here. I also thought he had a great chemistry here with Kate Blanchett. And both of these people, these characters, are into magic. And they and apparently this this clock that's located within the walls of this mysterious mansion is somehow bringing about an end to the world. And in what way, I'm not exactly going to reveal, but there is a backstory behind 
Jack Black's character, Jonathan Barnevelt, in that he had a magic partner by the name of Isaac Izzard, who's played in this movie by Kyle MacLachlan, and he also has a history with Isaac Izzard's wife, Selena Izzard, who's played by Renee Elise Goldberry. So there's a lo- there are a lot of characters in this film. There are some familiar themes, but I can't say that this is a a predictable film. If, if anything, it, it's a movie that had me guessing. And again, I've been an advocate of, of reading n- the, the source novels upon which movies are based first before seeing the movie, but there lies a bit of a double-edged sword to doing that. The, the first thing is that the, the book is almost always better than the movie. Even great movies like The Godfather, the book is usually better. And the second thing is that when you read the book, particularly a story that has a lot of twists, there is the potential of and the danger of knowing the twists before you go in to see the movie. And as a result, the twists aren't as fresh. But still, I really liked The House of the Clock and Its Walls. I thought it had really good special effects, great set design. Jack Black and Kate Blanchett worked incredibly well together. I thought Owen Vicario made a really good lead. Kyle MacLachlan made an interesting bad guy. And the, the way in which he interjects himself into the story, I won't exactly give away. But The House of the Clock and Its Walls, I think, is a movie that, very much like The Nightmare Before Christmas and Hocus Pocus, is going to be one of those films that people keep coming back to every Halloween. And it gets my rating of a knockout. There's a lot to love about this film, and I loved probably most of it. Is my kid in the right car seat? I guess she is. There are probably rules on when to move up to a booster seat, aren't there? Rear-facing, forward-facing, I think I have it right. Car crashes are a leading killer of children 1 to 13. Are your children in the right car seat for their age and size? Don't think you know, know you know. Go to safercar.gov slash the right seat. Brought to you by the National Highway Traffic Safety Administration and the Ad Council. Hey, 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 it's Genevieve, a.k.a. Miss Fab 617. And it's your girl, Crystal, a.k.a. The Crystal Lens. We're coming to you from our new show called Boston Boston Come Come Through. Through. We'll be bringing you the latest and greatest things happening in and around Boston. We'll be talking what? Black-owned businesses, social events, what? And the black experience. How's that sound, Genevieve? I love it. Dig it. Tune in every Wednesday at 9 p.m. Eastern time on Boston Free Radio. Boston, come through. Come listen. Welcome back to Words on Film, the spoken word show dedicated to moving pictures. I'm your host and movie critic, Dan Burke. The next movie I'm going to be reviewing for you is the highly awaited and highly anticipated Fahrenheit 11.9, which is not exactly a sequel to Fahrenheit 9.11, but it has a similar theme. In other words, this is taking on the government and pretty much saying it's not doing enough. And it also comes out at a time where, very much like Fahrenheit 9-11, we have a controversial president in office with whom Michael Moore, the writer and director of this film, not to mention its arguable star, has a problem with in office. And considering Donald Trump, who could blame him? Plus, before I go into this review even more, let me just remind you of my disclaimer. The views and opinions expressed on words on film are solely those, about movies or otherwise, Uh, of your host and movie critic, Dan Burke. They do not necessarily reflect the views and opinions of any employees who are working at the station airing this broadcast or the station as a whole. So with that said, let's get into my review of Fahrenheit 11.9. Let me just say, first of all, that I agree probably with 85 to 90% of Michael Moore's politics. I there, There are some things with with which I disagree with him, but I do appreciate the fact that he makes these films. He is acknowledging of his political bias. And also, even though these these films might seem to be preaching to the choir, I don't think that's Michael Moore's intent. And also, to his credit, Donald Trump is not the only target in Fahrenheit 11.9. Donald Trump is a big target in this movie, it's especially from the very beginning where Michael Moore wonders out loud more vulgarly than I'm going to say on the radio, 
how did we get here and where do we go from here? As a matter of fact, he examines the current, current state of American politics, particularly the Donald J. Trump presidency and gun violence, while highlighting the power of grassroots democratic movements. Probably the most inspiring parts of this movie is when he actually hi- highlights the grassroots movements that are going on in America right now, particularly some of the fringe candidates, particularly for U.S. Congress who are running right now, some of whom have had actually stunning upsets. And Michael Moore interviews a number of them. In fact, there is a guy who's running for Congress from West Virginia who is whose name, unfortunately, I forgot, but he is in this film, and Michael Moore spends quite a bit of time with him. But he's probably the best interviewee in this movie because not only does he have democratic views that are probably opposite, that are most definitely opposite of President Trump and many other Republicans, but he's also got chutzpah. In, in other words... He, he's saying to Michael Moore, I will fight you out in the street if I have to. It, it's, a, it's, a lot of, it's a lot of bravado there, but again, you got to admire this guy not only for his chutzpah, but also for his good ideas and his passion. And there are other people who are running for office who are interviewed in this movie, and there are similar anecdotes that really get a lot of people energized for the midterm elections. I know it's, it certainly does me. I can't wait to vote personally. I mean, I have to wait about six weeks to vote, but it's going to be a long six week wait, but a movie like Fahrenheit 11, nine certainly comes in a timely manner. Although Michael Moore does not have to emphasize why Donald Trump has been a bad president so far, and why he is generally a bad person. Note my disclaimer earlier, if you haven't already. There, the most disturbing part of Michael Moore's take on Donald Trump is when he starts showing pictures of Trump with his daughter Ivanka at several ages. And Michael Moore doesn't say it, but he implies that Ivanka might have been a victim of child abuse. What kind of child abuse? You could probably extrapolate that for yourselves, but rest assured, the pictures that Michael Moore brings up, which probably were not hard for him to to find, have been really disturbing. But I think Michael Moore takes on maybe about one-sixth of what's wrong with the Trump presidency. And basically, if you are listening to this broadcast and you don't know why Trump's presidency is bad and isn't working, you are probably not watching the news or refusing to pay attention. But the other poignant part of this documentary is the Flint water crisis. And unfortunately, there is one scene in this movie, which is archive footage, which made me disappointed in former President Obama. And the, and the way he handled the Flint water crisis. But Michael Moore also makes some harsh allegations amongst, uh, against the current Michigan governor, who doesn't look like he's going to be governor for very much longer. And he also plants the seed of blame solely on this governor. And honestly, considering that the Flint water crisis has been an issue for the last three years now, who could blame Michael Moore for making that that allegation, in addition to the fact that the Flint water crisis still hasn't been solved yet. And it's it's really heartbreaking. There is one funny scene in Fahrenheit 11.9 where Michael Moore actually goes to the governor's mansion and sprays the, the plants of the governor's with Flint water, water he got from Flint, Michigan. I thought that scene was funny, but after that's said and done, you still realize that Flint has a major problem and has been left to the sidelines. And Michael Moore's argument, which I think he makes well with some flaws, is that the government as a whole, not just Republicans, aren't doing enough. It was Lewis Black who said about 12 years ago during a, a different administration that the Republicans are the party of bad ideas and the Democrats are the party of no ideas. 
It's not a statement I agree with entirely, but Michael Moore, even though he doesn't reference Lewis, Lewis Black in this film, seems to agree with that wholeheartedly. So Fahrenheit 9-11 does have some flaws to it, but it's not better than Fahrenheit 9-11. Fahrenheit 11-9 gets my rating of a knockout still because it is a timely documentary that we need, especially for the midterm elections that are coming up right now. Dad, this is fun. I didn't think I'd like kayaking. Well, I'm glad you enjoyed it, but I think it's time to head back in. Okay. Can we come back? Sure. Hey, be careful getting out of the boat. It's a kayak, Dad. <laughs> I'm going to return the kayak. Can we walk home? How about a taxi? It's a short fare from your neighborhood to your naturehood. Visit discovertheforest.org to find a neighborhood park or green space near you. Brought to you by the Ad Council and the U.S. Forest Service. Welcome to Mr. Bear's Violet Hour Saloon, where the sky is evening gorgeous, the drinks won't cloud your head, and the cocktail nuts are poems. Join me, Mr. Bear, every Tuesday at 8 p.m. Boston time on bostonfreeradio.com for music, poetry, fiction, interviews, and more, making the lonely a little more bearable. Welcome back to Words on Film, the spoken word show dedicated to moving pictures. I'm your host and movie critic, Dan Burke. The next movie I'm going to be reviewing for you is Life Itself, which is not to be confused with the 2014 documentary about Roger Ebert, which also has the same name because it's based on the memoir that Roger Ebert wrote right before he died in 2013. This movie, Life Itself, has an all-star cast, including but not limited to Oscar Isaac, Olivia Wilde, Olivia Cook, Annette Bening, Antonio Banderas, and others. And it primarily centers itself, it tells three different stories about three different families who are somehow interconnected in a way that is relevant to the movie when you're watching it, but I won't reveal what it is. But it primarily centers around a young New York couple who are Will, who's played by Oscar Isaac, and Abby, played by Olivia Wilde. And it follows them as they go from college romance to marriage and the birth of their first child, in addition to the unexpected twists of their journey that create reverberations that echo over continents and through lifetimes. So the trials and tribulations of Will and Abby are the first thing you're introduced to in this movie. And you hear a lot about it from Will, Oscar Isaac's character, who's detailing his relationship or his former relationship, I'll tell you that much, with Dr. Kate Morris, who's played in this movie by Annette Bening. And to tell what the other characters are, it might actually spoil some of the connections between this, uh, these characters in this film, which is probably best seen rather than heard from me. But I will tell you that there is a young girl who's a punk rocker named Dylan, who's played by Olivia Cook, who lives with her grandfather, Erwin, who's played by Mandy Patinkin. And in addition to that, there's also a story about a young boy by the name of Rodrigo, who's played in this movie in adult form by Alex Moner, who I believe is a Spanish actor. Uh, yes, he's actually from Barcelona. And part of this film actually takes place in Spain. The other two parts take place in New York City. So what the connection is between all these characters, I can't reveal to you, which makes it kind of awkward because I have about five minutes left to review this movie for you. I will say, though, that there are exceptional acting performances in this movie. I was especially taken by the performances by Oscar Isaac, Antonio Banderas, and Sergio Peris Menchada, Menchada, excuse me, um, the latter of whom is a who is an actor who's a native of Spain, very similar to Alex Moner, as well as the the woman who plays uh, Paris Mencheta's wife, uh, La Ia Costa, who's also a Spanish actress. And one of the weaknesses of this film, which is directed and written by Dan Fogelman, by the way, who seems to be a very talented filmmaker, particularly when it comes to writing characters. And it's it's interesting because Dan Fogelman is known for 
having been one of the showrunners for This Is Us. In fact, he created the show, which is a huge hit right now. He also created the show Pitch from a couple of years ago and also wrote the screenplay to Tangled and the original story to Cars 2, the latter of which was eh, probably not the best. Actually, it was the quote-unquote worst of the of the Pixar films, but still it was... It was probably better than about 90% of animated films out there. But in any event, Dan Fogelman has a lot of experience writing screenplays. And this might be his feature film directorial debut. Actually, let me check that while I have the chance. But he's, he's certainly written a number of interesting films and TV shows. Actually, it's not his feature film debut. He previously wrote and directed the film Danny Collins, starring Al Pacino, Jennifer Garner, and Bobby Cannavale. So this is his sophomore movie, and unfortunately, it is a bit of a slump. It's, it's very well shot. It's, it seems to be well edited, but unfortunately, it's totally uneven, and there are characters that are given unnecessarily more screen time than they're probably than they probably deserve. I think the first third of the movie is brilliant as as well as heartbreaking. And then the second third of the movie seems to be one sixth of the amount of time as the last third of the movie. And that, that might not make sense to you because well it it probably doesn't make sense to you because you'd think if a film's cut into thirds that each one would be equal in size, but uh, that's really not the case. And the reason I'm cutting this movie into thirds is because there are three different sets of characters that occupy the screen. And I did think the last third of the movie, which isn't a third, it's probably more like five-twelfths of the movie, feels more like a uh, telenovela than it does a an integral part of this story you find out about one of the characters backstories how his parents met how he grew up but that doesn't really tie into the first two stories to which we're introduced there is a bit of irony at the very end of the film but unfortunately it's at the expense of one of the major characters and their development so by the time this movie ends you're not particularly satisfied with the film you just saw, or at least I wasn't. Again, I did appreciate the acting, uh, particularly by Oscar Isaac, Annette Bening, uh, Antonio Banderas, and Sergio Peris Mencheta, but unfortunately that wasn't enough to save this film, which I have to give my rating of a strikeout, because it, it had a great premise to it, and Certainly you have Dan Fogelman, who has created a monster hit of a show right now with This Is Us, which will I, I'm not predicting how much time will be on the air, but it'll probably be on the air for a few more years. But that's really been something with which a lot of people have identified, particularly with the characters and with their backstory. But unfortunately, this film which is about 30 minutes too long, doesn't leave that kind of impression on you. And it could have been if it devoted equal time to its characters. Steven. Who said that? Me, down here. What are you, a yellow booger? I'm a banana slug, Steven. What are you doing in my room? I'm your sense of adventure. It's been a long time since we've had an adventure in the forest. Mom took me to the forest last year. I'm a slug, Steven. It took me a long time to get here. You're right. I should get out. Yeah, the forest is not that far away. Hey, Mom! Come to the forest where the more adventurous you lives. Check out discovertheforest.org for cool places nearby. Brought to you by the U.S. Forest Service and the Ad Council. B F are bostonfreeradio.com Diane Wong here announcing a new radio program let's talk about race from our beginnings as a white supremacist society to our current existence as a white supremacist society race is a topic that affects us all and yet we have difficulty talking about it why is race so difficult 
why can't we talk openly about white supremacy? Why don't we like to talk about white privilege? Why is internalized oppression shrouded in mystery? What about lynching? What about gerrymandering and the current Black Lives Matters debate? We'll talk about all of it. Come and join us Thursdays from 7 to 8 p.m. Let's talk about race. Boston Free Radio. Welcome back to Words on Film, the spoken word show dedicated to moving pictures. I'm your host and movie critic, Dan Burke. The next movie I'm going to be reviewing for you is Assassination Nation, which comes from director and writer Sam Levinson, who very much like Dan Fogelman is also making his second sophomore film with this movie, which he also wrote. And it's a movie that takes place in a high school and is reminiscent of Heather's, at least at first, in the sense that it follows a group of teenage girls as they navigate the vicious life of being in high school. And after a malicious data hack exposes the secrets of the perpetually American town of Salem, and it's probably not Salem, Massachusetts, it might be Salem, Oregon, but the state in which this town Salem exists is not identified but in either way chaos descends and four girls must fight to survive while coping with the hack themselves so what happens is that some hacker who is vaguely identified in this film is going into people's computers and cell phones and spreading private photos and text messages of them at their expense It first starts out with a local politician, then it goes into the personal life of uh, the principal at the school, and then eventually students are targeted, including one named Lily, who's played by Odessa Young, who harbors a secret involving one of her next-door neighbors. What that is, I'm not exactly going to elaborate upon, but she is someone who is part of a clique, including Her friend Bex, who's played by Hari Neff, Sarah, played by Suki Waterhouse, and M, who's played by an actress named Abra. And Abra is not only an actress, but I think she's also a rapper and a producer. I've never heard of her before this movie, but she's she's pretty cool. But in any event, Assassination Nation is a movie that is also tonally uneven, but also what really hinders it is the fact that it's it starts out as pretty good satire about the internet age and the age of smartphones in which we live and also kind of gives a cautionary lesson about what you should and should not photograph and save on your phone it's okay to have secrets but when you put them on a digital device you risk eventually everyone knowing about it even if you don't intentionally post it on facebook or twitter but from there it starts to become ultra violent it it does have stylized violence but unfortunately the downside of this film is it gets so caught up in that violence that it forgets what it's making a statement about or what it's satirizing. And another weakness of this film is that the only character that really gets developed is the character of Lily. You don't really know anybody else in this film other than the, other than her. I mean, you, you get a sense of what her friends are like. In fact, there's one actress in this film Harry Neff, who, whose first name is spelled H-A-R-I, by the way, and she is actually a transgender uh, actress who plays transgender in this movie. And I, I didn't realize she was transgender about until about 30 minutes in, but eventually her going from being a, a boy to a girl becomes somewhat of a crucial subplot in this film, or at least it brings about an interesting discussion and also shows how much high school has changed from the time before smartphones where homophobia was far more rampant than it is now. It still exists, but it was a lot more blatant when I was in high school. I assure you of that. But the unfortunate part about this is with focusing on only one character, Lily, the rest of the characters become stereotypes. 
the jocks only become, you know, just these Neanderthal guys. The girls are just not particularly interesting, including one girl named Reagan, who's played by Bella Thorne, who occasionally hangs out with the, the group of four girls who you meet in this film, but you don't really know whether she is a friend of these girls or an enemy. I mean, at one point, it seems like the four of them brush Bella Thorne's character off, and then another time they have an interesting conversation with her about the age of the internet, and then another time a character actually attacks Bella Thorne's character for no reason at all with a baseball bat. And as you're watching this, at least I was wondering, where did this come from? And also, once the movie develops into beyond a satire of our social media age and becomes this ultra violent revenge fantasy, it loses its grasp entirely on reality. And it doesn't really tell you or give you any indication that this might be a dream. Of course, as I was watching this ultra stylish violence going on, I was thinking, first of all, how did these four girls in high school learn to shoot with such aim as they do? And secondly, is this really a dream? And if it is, I'll be disappointed because that's a cop out. But if it isn't, why the hell is all this stuff going on? And it's just, it becomes cartoonish and it becomes unbearable, honestly. By the time this movie ended, I... I thought to myself, well, this is a very stylish film, and it certainly has good cinematography, but what is its message? It has to have some sort of message, doesn't it? Otherwise, it's just Fa Force 4, so to speak. This is a movie that certainly has been inspired by Quentin Tarantino, but it doesn't have the character development or the story that Quentin Tarantino requires rightly so, in all of his films. This is just a Quentin Tarantino wannabe film. And also, the title of the film doesn't make any sense. Assassination Nation? Assassination doesn't quite make a lot of sense in the context of the high school part of the film, unless you're counting character assassination, but that doesn't really seem to be the point of the film. So Assassination Nation gets my ring of a flunk out because it's stylized, but... In terms of story and in terms of character development, it is criminally unfocused. And I know that Sam Levinson, as a writer and director, knows better than to release trash like this. Don't ignore facial redness. It could be an early warning sign of rosacea, a life-disruptive facial disorder that gets worse without treatment. Over time, the redness becomes more persistent and tiny blood vessels may appear. Without medical help, bumps, pimples, and even facial disfigurement often develop. 16 million Americans have rosacea, yet only a small fraction are being treated. Don't ignore the warning signs. See a dermatologist or visit the National Rosacea Society at rosacea.org. I love those real sick signs. They're the ones that move me. A thinly blow. <laughs> Intensify and groove me. All this and more on Unpacked Music. Saturdays at noon on Boston Free Radio. Welcome back to Words on Film, the spoken word show dedicated to moving pictures. I'm your host and movie critic, Dan Burke, and now that I've reviewed all four movies that I'm going to review for the show, it's now time for me to get into my next segment, which is what's coming up next. This is a spoken word preview of the movies that are coming to a theater near you, unless I say otherwise, this coming weekend, starting Friday, September 28th. And the fall season of 
of movies is starting to get into full swing. There are certainly more and more interesting films that are about to come out. And one of the biggest film that's coming out this coming weekend is one called Night School. This is a live action comedy about a group of troublemakers who are forced to attend night school in hope that they pass, they'll pass the GED exam to finish high school. These two troublemakers in the movie are Tiffany Haddish and Kevin Hart, or at least I think one of them is a troublemaker. The other one is a night school teacher, but I'm I'm pretty sure it's Kevin Hart who's the one who's the troublemaker who needs his GED. But the movie also co-stars Brooke Butler and Taron Killam. I can't say whether or not it's going to be funny. It might be really hilarious. It might be a dud. But with Kevin Hart and Tiffany Haddish, it is promising because I like both of those actors. So Night School is a film that I will be watching this coming weekend when it comes out, and I will review it for you come next week's show. Another movie that's coming out in theaters this coming weekend is an animated film called Smallfoot. And this is a movie about a Yeti, in other words, one of those Bigfoot creatures who lives in the frozen wilderness, who is convinced that the elusive creatures known as humans, and humans are in quotes, really do exist. This film stars Channing Tatum, I guess as the voice of the Smallfoot, James Corden, Zendaya, and Common amongst other actors. Let me actually see what other actors who are doing voices in this film. Let's see. In addition to the four I just mentioned, LeBron James is one of the voices. Kind of interesting. Not a bad choice, though. Danny DeVito, who, my God, is this his 20th character he's he's done the voice of not that i don't like him but my god he 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 seems to sign on to just about every animated film it seems there's also gina rodriguez and that just about does it with uh people i i know by first name but smallfoot is a film that is not a disney film or disney pixar it's released by let me see oh the war animation group So, War Animation has been, in terms of its most recent films, hit or miss. Uh, Some of them have been good, like, actually, I I can't think of one, but Smallfoot is a film I'm definitely going to see. I can't say whether it's good or not. It probably will pale in comparison to anything that Disney Pixar has released, but it is a movie I will see, and I will review it for you for next week's show. Another movie that's coming out in theaters this coming weekend is one called Hellfest. This one already has a great name, and it's a movie about a masked serial killer who turns a horror-themed amusement park into his own personal playground, terrorizing a group of friends while the rest of the patrons believe that it is all part of the show. That is the most amazing premise I have read in a really long time, but just because the premise is amazing doesn't necessarily mean that the film is, but this seems like a cool film to be released before Halloween. And I was mentioning earlier in my review of the house of the clock and its walls that it's, it could be a Halloween favorite, but it's released quite a bit, quite a while before Halloween, about five weeks before Halloween. It seems to be one of those things where stores are getting out the Halloween stuff even before kids go back to school. And that didn't happen when I was a kid. That seems to be a very common occurrence right now. But in any event, this is a Halloween-themed movie for adults because it's rated R, or (laughs) at least a film to which kids should be accompanied by adults, just saying. And it's directed by a guy named Gregory Plotkin. And I'm just trying to read his repertoire. He has edited a number of films uh, recently, including... World War Z, Happy Death Day, and he has directed, he, he actually directed a film, the, the fifth paranormal activity movie, Paranormal Activity, The Ghost Dimension, and it's good to see that he's directing a film that's not a found footage movie. Even though I didn't see the fifth paranormal activity movie, it was the, the fifth in the series, so it probably wasn't nearly as good as the first. But Hellfest looks like a fun movie in, in that demented R-rated kind of way. And that's a film I will definitely see if it's coming out in the theater near me, and I'll let you know what I think come next week's show. Another movie that's coming out probably at least, if not in 
theaters worldwide. It's at least coming to your art house theater. It's one called The Old Man and the Gun. And what's interesting about this film is this is the film that Robert Redford claims is going to be his last film before he retires. Now, Robert Redford's been around for a long time, and he's 82 years old. So while it's a little bit heartbreaking to hear that he's retiring, it's not entirely unexpected. But The Old Man and the Gun is based on the true story of Forrest Tucker and his audacious escape from San Quentin Quentin prison at the age of 70 to an unprecedented string of heists that confounded authorities and enchanted the public. So we're talking a real legend here. And as I said, the movie stars Robert Redford. It also co-stars Casey Affleck, Sissy Spacek, and Danny Glover, amongst other people. And as I mentioned before, it is based on a true story. The director, David Lowery, is a young guy, uh, comparatively. He's 37 years old. And in terms of the movies he's directed, he's, he's edited a number of films. And he's directed... He directed a ghost story from last year, which has gotten already a cult following. That also starred Casey Affleck. He directed the remake of Pete's Dragon, which of all the remakes of Disney films, that one is unquestionably the best. It also happened to co-star Robert Redford. And he has directed a number of shorts. One of the feature films he's directed includes uh, one called Saint Nick, which is not actually a Christmas story. It's a story of a brother and sister on the run. But in any event, this being Robert Redford's last film that Robert Redford claims, this is probably going to have some Oscar buzz. I hope it's coming out in a theater near me. It's rated PG-13, so kids can see it too. And if I do see it, I'll review it for you next week on this show. So definitely stay tuned for that. I'm voting in the midterm elections because my constitutional right. Because my ancestors died. To make it better for my children. The women before me fought. So we can remain free. Helping your community out. Midterm elections. I know every vote makes a difference. My opinion matters. I vote. I vote. I vote in the midterm election. Register now on IamAVoter.com. And don't forget to vote Tuesday, November 6th. Brought to you by I Am A Voter and the Ad Council. Every Tuesday at 3, something special happens on Boston Free Radio. Why, it's Toppers with your host, Gil. Toppers, spinning the tunes that today's youth demand. From Justin Bieber to Lady Gaga to the Fleetwoods. And, on occasion, Hoagie Carmichael. If you missed the program, you can check out the archives at Toppers Radio. That's one word, dot blogspot, dot C-O-M. Toppers. Welcome back to Words on Film, the spoken word show dedicated to moving pictures. I'm your host and movie critic, Dan Burke, and I'm continuing with my segment of What's Coming Up Next, which I started early this show because I ran out of films to review. It happens. But there is one other film that's coming out, I'm sure, in in wide release, and that is Little Women. And this is a modern retelling of the Louisa May Alcott's classic novel, which it seems like every woman is required to read in grade school. Not so many men. In fact, I admit that I haven't read the book or seen any of the movies. But this follows the lives, very much like Alcott's book did, of four sisters, Meg, Joe, Beth, and Amy March, detailing their passage from childhood to womanhood. Despite harsh times, they cling to optimism, and as they mature, they face blossoming ambitions and relationships as well as tragedy while maintaining their unbreakable bond as sisters. This movie doesn't star a whole lot of people that I know except for Leah Thompson, who plays the matriarch of this family of little women. The other women in the movie, in case you are... Curious include mm, Melanie Stone, Sarah Davenport, Taylor Murphy, Elise Jones, and Allie Jennings. Those are basically the the main four women in the movie. I'm not particularly familiar with them, at least by name, but having a modern retelling of Little Women is actually not a bad idea, and I'm surprised that they didn't come up with this earlier, particularly when they were 
doing that thing in the late 90s in the film industry when they were remaking these classic stories into modern day adaptations like William Shakespeare's Romeo and Juliet and Great Expectations. But I, I'm interested to see what if the the story of Little Women does fit well into modern day adaptation. I assume it does, otherwise they wouldn't have made a movie out of it, but you never know. But Little Women is a movie I will see, and I'll let you know what I think come next week's show. These other movies might be coming out in limited release, I'm not entirely sure, but one of the big ones is Bad Reputation, which is a documentary about who else? Rock star Joan Jett. It features interviews by Billy Joe Armstrong, Rodney Bingenheimer, Carrie Ann Brickman and Bill Kerbishley, and probably Joan Jett herself, since she's still alive and little, literally rocking. I would love to see that if it's coming out in theater near me. I can't guarantee whether or not it will, but it might be coming out on video on demand. But if I do see it, I will let you know what I think come next week's show. Another movie that's coming out in limited release is one called Monsters and Men. This is a movie about the aftermath of a police killing of a black man told through the eyes of a bystander who filmed the act, who is an African-American police officer and a... Oh, excuse me. It is told through the eyes of three people. One is the bystander who filmed the act, one is an African-American police officer, and the other one is a high school baseball phenom inspired to take a stand. And this movie stars John David Washington, who's probably the most well-known of the actors in this film. But it also co-stars other actors like Shante Adams, uh, Nicole Bihari, Cara Buono, and others. But this is a movie that certainly touches upon the same themes as other movies that have come out in recent week uh recent months i should say if it is coming out in theater near me i will let i will review it and i will let you know exactly what i think come next week's show and finally the only other movie that's coming out in limited release that's here on the list of what's coming up next is one called all about nina this one stars mary elizabeth winstead of scott pilgrim versus the world she played the purple-haired love interest of Michael Sarah's character. And here she plays Nina Geld, who is a bracingly funny and blisteringly provocative stand up comedian whose career is taking off, but whose personal life is a near complete disaster. Yeah, I can kind of relate to one of those things. Maybe not the career taking off, but to escape a difficult ex and to prepare for a prospectively life changing audition, Nina flees to Los Angeles where she meets Rafe, who's played by Common the actor and rapper, who challenges almost every preconception she has, including those around her own deeply troubled past. There's a lot there with that that description, but it looks like, it, it sounds like a very interesting premise, and it looks like it could be a pretty good movie. It's directed by a woman by the name of Eva Vives, who is a Spanish director, and this is her feature film debut as a director, actually. Uh, the other films she's made have, have been shorts, but that looks interesting. And if it's coming out in the theater near me, which I doubt, I'll check it out and I'll let you know what I think come next week's show. But that just about does it for Words on Film for this week. Words on Film is the spoken word show dedicated to moving pictures. And I am your host and movie critic, Dan Burke, having, as always, a great time discussing movies with you. And until next week's show, this is Dan Burke saying I'll see you at the movies. Para mucha gente del país, tener un día de tranquilidad con la familia es difícil. Le pasa a Raquel, de Dallas, una madre que trabaja. Ah, los niños tienen que ir a la escuela, nosotros tenemos que ir al trabajo. Le pasa a Salvador, un taxista de Nueva York que tiene dos hijas. Trabajo alrededor de 9 a 10 horas diaria. Le pasa hasta Remy, un niño que vive en Los Ángeles. A veces tengo que ayudarle a mi mamá. Y es que el estrés y las preocupaciones son algo muy común. Pero hay algo que mucha gente no sabe. Y es que el bosque, ese respiro que necesitan, está realmente cerca. Yo no sabía que había muchos bosques aquí cerquita. Yo considero que esto es buena vida, estar aquí. Tu familia también puede disfrutar de la tranquilidad del bosque a solo un paso. Entra en descubreelbosque.org y encuentra el bosque más cercano. Este lugar es increíble. Recuerda, entra en descubreelbosque.org, el bosque más cerca de lo que crees. 
Un mensaje del Servicio Forestal de los Estados Unidos. stuff under there? What about jobs? No? Now try your basement. There's a pair of overalls that overall you're not so into anymore. A perfectly good laptop that hasn't sat in your lap in months. And even more stuff, but still no jobs? Well, you really have both. See, stuff is defined as household articles considered as a group. Sometimes this stuff is no longer needed. Wait, no longer needed? That can't be right. Because remember those jobs you were looking for? Those are really needed, and they're the stuff inside your stuff, even inside that winter coat that moved with you to Phoenix. Our job is to unlock those jobs, and it starts when you donate your stuff to your local Goodwill. Here's how we do it. When you donate to Goodwill, we sell your stuff to provide job training for people right here in your community. So just by teaming up with Goodwill, you help create jobs. And isn't that worth parting with the leftover key tar from your 80s cover band? Goodwill. Donate stuff, create jobs. Find your nearest donation center at Goodwill.org. A message from Goodwill. A mighty feast of hot steaming music.